Good afternoon. For the record, my name is Brian Worrell, District 4 City Councilor, and I am the chair um, of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. Today is April 22nd, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. Today's hearing is de dedicated to public testimony but you are welcome to testify any of our hearings. We will take public testimony at the end of each departmental hearing and will be hosting another public testimony session on Tuesday, May 22nd at 6 p.m. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form, form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation or residence and limit your comments to a few minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. You can email your written testimony to the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. You can submit a two-minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the City Council budget process and how to testify, please visit the City Council's budget website at boston.gov backslash council dash budget. Today's public uh, testimony is on dockets number 060670 through 0672. Order for the FY25 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations for the school department and the other post-employment benefits. Docket number 0673 through 0675. Orders for a capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket number 0676 through 0678. Orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. These matters were sponsored by Mayor Michelle Wu and referred to the committee on April 9th, 2024. Today, um, I'm joined by my council colleagues, uh, Councilor Santana, Councilor Flynn, Councilor Murphy, and Council President Louis Jen. Uh, we also received a letter of absence from Council Weber, who cannot make it tonight. Um, it's the first night of Passover, so I want to make sure I'm wishing him and all of our um, Jewish constituents a, a joyous Passover. I want to thank everyone for coming today, and I'm going to repeat myself a bit from the, mor from the morning operating budget hearing, but I think it's important from th that the public is fully aware of the steps of the budget process. We have in front of us uh, the mayor's budget, and through collaboration and public testimony, we will be either amending or accepting uh, this, this budget, creating a final budget that we all feel a part of. We cannot increase the overall budget. And with, through uh, conversations with the community and chiefs, we'll be coming to a, um, a final budget. We're going to have amendment working sessions either every other Friday in May, and we'll have about six budget hearings per week till Memorial Day. On June 5th, at the council's weekly meeting, we'll vote on amendments to this budget. At the June 12th meeting, the council will be presented with any mayoral vetoes, and, on, and at the June 26th meeting, the council will have a chance to override any of those um, vetoes. We'll go straight to public testimony, starting with in-person uh, public testimonies. And if you haven't had a chance to sign up for in-person public testimony, to my left where Karishma um, just pulled off the paper, please sign up there. And we'll go first with Mickey, Mickey Court, Cotton. Co Coatwell, sorry. How are you? How you doing, Mickey? Does it matter which side? It uh, doesn't matter either side. Okay, thank you. Hello, oh, you can hear me. Yes. Madam President, Chairman Worrell, and council members, I'm pleased to be here with you again today. I know many of you have seen our program firsthand and have visited our closets 
and you know that we're focused on your initiatives, which include chronic absenteeism, English language learners, migrant settlers, and bullying. Um, but for those that may not be aware of what we do, I will just begin with a small overview. Katie's Closet was established to address a significant barrier to education. We discovered that lack of access to clothing and basic necessities was among the top 10 reasons for chronic absenteeism. Furthermore, this issue disproportionately affected low-income children and most widely affects children of color. We were determined to solve this problem and developed two signature programs to address it, an in-school closet program and our SOS urgent response program. The in-school closet program provides a school who meets the threshold of 50% or more low-income enrollment rate with an in-house free store where children have the agency to shop and choose what they like, clothing that reflects their unique style, giving them the opportunity to be me with confidence. We position the closets in, in school for several reasons. It provides immediate access and eliminates the need for an application for services or an intermediary. It's relationship building. The kids call our closets their safe place. Once they're given access by a trusted faculty member and begin working with them, they open up about all their concerns. They may be homeless, being bullied, abused, can't see the chalkboard, or sick. By being in school, we encourage kids to run towards school for support versus choosing the street. We know they will receive two meals and a snack, as well as access to clothing and essentials on demand. Our work focuses on attendance because education is the surest path out of poverty. We also know that unless kids show up, all other supportive programs and services become less effective. Our SOS Urgent Response Program supports children who are transitioning between stable living conditions. This includes, again, homelessness, foster care, fire victims, and survivors of abusive situations. We work with vetted social service agencies to meet their needs. Just recently, Katie's Closet was called upon to support 144 newcomers in Boston. Within 24 hours, every child was supported with up to two weeks of clothing and essentials. Once they transition into a BPS school with a closet, they will be able to continue receiving support until their families are on their feet. But today I'm before you because we're facing a challenge. We do know both of these programs are important and highly regarded by the community, exemplified by the fact that we currently operate in 51 schools and support 30,000 children in the city. We also have a wait list of schools waiting for funding to receive their closet. The cost to operate an elementary school is $25,000 per year and $50,000 for high schools. So the annual cost of these 51 schools will be $1,750,000 in the start of the new year. Currently, we're unable to access adequate funding from our contract because it's based on what a school can contribute versus a central budget. We appreciate the scope of the contract, which allows Katie's Closet to be paid up to $1.1 million. However, we will only receive $232,000 this year. We need a direct funding mechanism from the central office as individual school budgets continue to be insufficient. And unless we can work together to fund the program in any unique way you can think of, we're reaching a point where we will have to remove closets by August 1st for the 24-25 school year. We hope you agree that the Katie's Closet program is essential and will include funding in the FY25 budget. The deck that was passed out to you respectfully provides information that you and your team uh, can use to understand our impact and great desire to not reduce the number of schools and students we serve, but rather expand our impact in BPS. I do appreciate your time and consideration today. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Um, Cahill, um, how? Hello? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah, my bad. Let me just get my laptop real quick. And then next we'll have uh, Rachel Rodriguez and Pace. Hi, my name is Khalil Howe. Uh, I'm a coordinator with the Youth Justice and Power Union and a resident of District 6. Um, there are families struggling to eat, struggling to make ends meet, and Mayor Wu and the council want to fund the police. Uh, I'm frankly disgusted by the passing of last year's budget, the police contract increase, and Mayor Wu's new proposed budget. This and the emphatic disregard of the community by the city councilors um, 
I'm demanding that the city councilor amend Mayor Wu's budget and defund the police and pour money into youth jobs, affordable housing, participatory budgeting, and the community-led mental health crisis response. Um, YJPU, the Youth Justice and Power Union, held a community town hall and asked the community what they need, and not one person said more money for the police. They said money for artists, money for mental health resources, truly affordable housing, more programs and jobs for youth, higher wages, universal basic income, better transportation. Um, last year, YJP rallied, like we have for many years, uh, to defund the police, and Councillor Worrell and Coletta changed their vote from yes last year as soon as their constituents left the room. So this year, Councillor Worrell, I'm asking if you'll meet with us and listen to your community, the community that we got petitions from last year urging, to def urging you to defund the police, the community that elected you. More police does not equal less violence. Police do not prevent violence. Voting to pass this budget is a direct smack in the face to people of color who are the primary victims of police violence. Everyone voting to increase the police budget has blood on their hands. Thank you. Thank you, Cahill. Um, Rachel, Cahill, thank you. Rachel um, Rodriguez and Pace, followed by Carlos Denglager. Um, good evening, um, Chairman Worrell and, and counselors here present today. Um, my name is Pace McConkey Jr. for the record, and um, I'm the policy manager at the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute. I'm grateful to testify before you all today to say some things that we've said before and we're excited to say again um, before this body. And the, the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute um, is a Boston-based organization um, designated to providing peace and supporting families and communities impacted by violence in the city. Um, the Peace Institute was founded by Clementina Sherry and the mother of Louis D. Brown after Louis's tragic passing at 15 years old in 1993. For, over three, for almost three decades, the Louis D. Brown Peace Institute has served as the cornerstone of the City of Boston's homicide response. Beginning in 1996, the City of Boston Police Department and the Mayor's Office and other city officials were started referring survivors to the Peace Institute to receive services in the aftermath of homicide. Um, the Peace Institute has risen to that occasion over the 30 years of service and continues to meet that need um, day by day in all neighborhoods within the city of Boston. Um, the needs of survivors of homicide victims have recently been exacerbated by COVID-19 and other public health impacts and continues to rise in the city of Boston even as instances of violence may be statistically declining. The, the presence of survivors still very much exists in the city and their needs still very much exist. For this reason, we call upon the city of Boston and this body um, to meet those needs by increasing the budgeted allocation to the Peace Institute, the organization that the city of Boston relies so heavily on when it comes to meeting the needs of families and communities impacted by homicide in the city. Uh, good evening, Rachel Rodriguez, co-executive director with the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute. Because homicide response touches many aspects of the city of Boston community and city government, we'll be returning with more specific comments during the individual department hearings this month and in May. Across city government, we're requesting a four-year commitment of one million annually for homicide response. That funding would go towards 300,000 to increase the Rest in Peace Fund, which is funding from the City of Boston Burial Fund and supporting funer funeral and memorial costs. Currently, we receive 50,000 for that. Um, 200,000 aiding survivors in the aftermath of a homicide, offering safety relocation, utility assistance, food, and more. 200,000 additional direct services filling the gaps of the Massachusetts Victims of Violence Crime Compensation and 300,000 for organizational sustainability. Investing in the operations, the staffing, and direct services provided by the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute that are critical to us um, providing these services across the city. Currently, the city of Boston contributes only about 8% of what it costs the Peace Institute to provide these services to families whose loved ones have died due to homicide, suicide, overdose, and COVID that we're currently um, supporting. Mayor Wu has publicly stated that the Peace Institute is part of the infrastructure of the city of Boston's homicide response. 
we're respectfully asking for funding support that reflects that reality. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I really look forward to meeting with each of you in the coming weeks. Thank you. And um, Rachel and Pace, can you submit the, the proposal outline that you just went over with Absolutely. the dollar amounts? Absolutely. We will give you the details. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Carlos? Good afternoon or good evening. Um, my name is Melissa. Uh, thank you, Councillor Worrell, uh, for chairing this public hearing. Public, this is a word I'm going to repeat and emphasize multiple times in this speech. I am a member of the public with no desire to ever be a public servant, like ever. On my way to this fiscal year 25 budget hearing to offer public testimony, I of course traversed Boston's public sidewalks. The sun was shining and I stopped for a moment to talk with some community members who reside at the New England Home and Center for Veterans, which according to MapQuest is 0.2 miles away from this very building. I always enjoy hearing the experiences and insight from Boston's veterans as they are former public employees. As we watched vehicles wind their way up Court Street, one thing stood out, a massive pothole that continues to pose a significant danger to members of the public, be they drivers or disabled residents of Boston, the latter whom are entitled to safe thoroughfare on public streets and public sidewalks pursuant of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Per docket number 0670, the mayor contends, this proposed budget increases accessibility to improve our processes and ensure the city will continue to provide exceptional constituent services across our neighborhoods. Last year, we filled more than 7,000 potholes, repainted 100,000 feet of crosswalks, and extended hours at 21 libraries. As Olivia Rodrigo saying, good for you, but I'm here to call cap, I'm here to call bullshit, I'm here to call shenanigans. The city of Boston apparently cannot even address a massive pothole on Court Street, directly in front of the New England Home and Center for Veterans, a mere 0.2 miles away from this very building. When I leave this building and take public transit back to Dorchester, I will commute with care, uh, careful to avoid litter and trash and refuse and walk past the District 4 office and again wonder why this particular area of Dorchester is disproportionately impacted by litter, a wash and trash and refuse. Time as a vessel then, learning to love, might be my way back to the sea. The flying, the metal, the turning above, these are just ways to be seen. How do we, the members of the public, trust that the city of Boston will use capital investments to ensure exceptional city services when y'all can't even provide basic constituent services? Math has never been a strong suit of mine, but I will continue to follow these fiscal year 25 budget hearings very closely, public, the etymology of the word, open to general observation. I look forward to particular and pointed observation at these hearings. As I noted last year to Adam Cedarbaum, chief of the city's legal department, when I noticed the lack of functioning elevators in Boston City Hall, God and the devil are in the details. I will close with the lyrics of the Interpol song, Public Pervert. We all get paid. Yeah, some faith get faith before they die. Then through stars we will navigate. Through the holes in your eyes, how many days will it take to land? How many ways to reach abandon? Oh, abandon. Thank you. Thank you. Amaya French. And then next, after Amaya, Alexa Santana. Um, hello, I'm Amaya, I'm 15, I live in Dorchester, and I'm with the organization Youth Justice Power Union. I think that putting funding into the police budget would not be beneficial for our community, because through the years, police have not been able to, have not been able to handle people going through mental crises. Living in a low-income neighborhood, I have come to notice that there are many issues in our city, such as food deserts, non-affordable housing, Unsanitary, unsanitary environments and kids having to be scared to go to school every day. I see homeless people in every street, but barely see grocery stores unless we drive 24 minutes away from home. We have been begging for Mayor Wu to listen to us and have, gotten, have got little to nothing in return. You're supposed to be helping us, providing us with what we need, and you think more police in our streets is supposed to fix that? 
We are done begging, and we are now demanding that you listen to what our community has to say. Thank you. Uh, Alexis Santana. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Alexa, a youth organizer at the Youth Justice and Power Union. I reside in Boston. I believe pouring funding into the police is ineffective and not supporting the members of our community. Police have proven time and time again that they are not suitable to handle mental health crises. The money being put towards the police could be put into the mental health crisis response. Opportunities are not being given to people in low-income communities to access help. As a young Hispanic girl, I have faced many adversities and I've gone through so much. Help was not available to me. And I know that many other people of color face the same problems. We need to meet the needs of our community. Thank you. Kiara Nunez. Hi, my name is Kyra Nunez. I'm a youth organizer at YJPU Youth Justice and Power Union, and I live in District 7. I'm demanding that instead of adding more money, we must de uh, defund money from the police and put it towards something the community feels they are in need of, such as adding a range of pay rates for the youth that have worked longer than the first year's employees and that have more experience. They should, be, they should get paid more due to them being able to help more. We should also have pay rates due to the fact that the older our youth employees get, the more money that they have to start paying the more money they have to start using for necessities themselves. And $15 is not gonna cut it. It's not gonna get them what they need. I also believe we need youth to have year-round jobs just due to the obvious part that some kids have to work in order to keep themselves fed and to help their parents pay rent. And within those few months without jobs, anything can happen to those kids without a way of having income. Me and my program are constantly advocating for the people of our community. You guys are constant, constantly ignoring us, telling us that you'll consider what we say, and we never see change. You guys actually did the opposite of what we asked and added $45 million to the police budget, which nobody in the community asked for. Is that, who you guys, is that for the guys who you work for to help? You guys are constantly ignoring them, just doing what you think is right instead of listening. If you can't do your jobs and listen to listen to the community and help them, then move aside and let somebody else do it. Thank you. George Lee. Good evening. Thank you for holding this hearing and being here tonight. I want to talk on a few themes. One is where money should be invested, how the police budget is too big and where it can be cut, and about this process and the city council's role and the community's role in it. As you've heard already and have heard over multiple years, not only from our group, but from many other groups, there needs to be a lot more investments in participatory budgeting, which I appreciate. I know if some of y'all, when you were running for office, said you agreed to 1% of the budget going toward PB. So that would be $43 million. Right now, it's only 3.5 million. And actually, the mayor decreased that line item from last year. So that's definitely an area that y'all should be fighting for. Affordable housing, right now the um, budget for new housing, the special appropriations line in the housing department is only 40 million, which is pathetically low compared to what we need. Mental health crisis response, led by the community, the uh, community design group had created a model that has still to be implemented. And then youth jobs, in addition to the pay rates going up and the pay range, and um, year-round jobs that Kyra mentioned. Um, we also need to make sure we have outreach workers that can actually help fill these jobs. Um, there's also a number of organizations that actually, even though the youth jobs budget has gone, has increased actually over last year, there's been no conversation with our groups about whether that's money that's gonna to go to what we're asking for. And there's actually some organizations that have had their slots cut from last year who are wondering what the heck is happening basically. Um, the police budget is going up from 405 to 455 million, and it's a farce. Um, this mayor ran on fake promises of trying to move money from the police budget to community needs, and this is what she's actually doing. Every year, she's hiring two classes of police officers instead of one. They're mega classes, which are bigger, so we're just increasing the number of police that we're hiring every year. Um, when actually, if we just let them retire, we can put the money into something else that's actually gonna prevent um, 
the problems that they're supposed to supposedly addressing. So calling on y'all to really look at cutting that item over time. The mayor claimed that her contract reforms would cut over time. But if you look, this year's budget increases over time from $44 million to almost $51 million. Again, it's just broken promises. That's something that y'all can help cut. Y'all can help cap that over time. Equipment, last year we showed that there were a lot of line items for equipment that the police weren't even spending their whole budget. And yet their police equipment line item has gone up by $2 million. So these are all examples of overtime, employees, equipment, where you could cut the budget. And we need to know how much the police actually spent in each line item last year. I don't know if y'all have that data already. I know our groups have been asking for it and we're told that it wasn't available yet. We need to know how much they're spending this year compared to what they were budgeted for. Finally, about process. The question is whether the city council is gonna just be a rubber stamp for the mayor's budget or not. And especially um, Council Morrell in your role as chair, what you're going to do to actually make sure that community input is respected and reflected in the amendments that y'all vote on and in the final budget. Um, it's a $4.3 billion budget. And to, to think that y'all are struggling to figure out how to move even 40, 60, 100 million here and there in such a large budget um, kind of defies imagination why y'all can't figure out. You know, every other, you know, the state house, they go to go head to head with the governor, Congress goes head to head, head with the, the president. Y'all need to figure out how to actually use your powers to uplift community voice and not just be rubber stamps and not just move like 50,000 here, $100,000 there. Y'all need to actually have real budget amendments. Um, and two notes about process. Um, Chair Rorau, we're asking that you actually change the youth jobs hearing, which is scheduled at 2 o'clock p.m. to make it occur at 4 o'clock or later, although that day actually there's some big community events going on, so we'd like to you to work with us to figure out a day that would work so we can actually get young people here to testify about what, what they need and um, reiterating the ask that you meet with us to figure out what a, a real budget process looks like this year. That's not just a rubber stamp. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kwame? Good, after good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Kwame Elias. I represent uh, District 4 where I live, as well as uh, the Boston Caribbean American Association. Um, hats off to the youths uh, there. Uh, it's, it's a hard act to follow. I feel like my ask or my uh, request uh, is minute compared to theirs, but here we go. Um, the three points I would like to address is the funding for the Cultural Center Study, uh, funding for Caribbean history to be taught in schools, and funding for home ownership down payments and home ownership vouchers. There's that famous phrase, all the world's a stage. I dare say all the city is a stage and Boston deserves a cultural center. In my quick research, I was four years old when an area college student, an MIT student, penned a thesis in this vein. My, my age now begins with another four. Boston, what have we done in 40 years? When I look at the vitality of a city, it be, it's because of its humanity. Quote, when people come together, an expressive energy usually arises as creativity, ideas, passions, and talents are shared. Interactions we can all call perform, interactions we can call performance or theater in many circumstances are then taking place. Thus, the city becomes transformed into a stage whose actors whose advocates, whose faces are its people. We have all the above. We definitely have the people, except the place to come together, the cultural center. Boston, let's not handicap ourselves for another 40 years. And in regards to funding for Caribbean history to be taught in schools, what I've learned in my few short years here on Earth is that people excel when they feel a sense of belonging they excel when they feel understood. They excel when they are celebrated. Caribbean immigrants and her descendants, overwhelmingly being the number one immigrant group in Boston, deserves nothing less. Caribbean history should be taught in our schools. The history of freedom in America arguably began not when the slave owners like Thomas Jefferson or George Washington, 
but in the Caribbean with the revolution in Haiti and broader struggles for freedom from colonialism. While countries of the Caribbean may be geographically tiny, our impact on the development of global economies, political thought has been monumental. Just as Haiti was the first country to embrace blackness as an ideology, as an ideological position, promoting true freedom and the right of self-determination, the people of the Caribbean were the first in the 20th century to invite people of the African diaspora to unite in pan-ethnic liberation movements. Note, ultimately, these included Garveyism, Rastafarianism, and the US Civil Rights Movement. Now bear with me here, um, I did French uh, in high school and college, so I may butcher some of these names. But without Jose Marti, Antonio Marcio, Evaristo Estones, Marcus Garvey, Luisa Capitillo, Franz Fanon, Amer Césaire, Walter Rodney, Jose Peña Gomez, Sonia Peer, Stokely Carmichael, a.k.a. Kwame Ture, my namesake, Jamaica Kim Kincaid, and Bob Marley, societies everywhere would likely have never challenged, let alone defeated, the values of inequality, exclusion, hierarchy, Eurocentrism, as successfully as they did. But yet we do not celebrate them and their descendants by teaching such a rich history in our schools. I can go on to name many notable Americans who are of Caribbean descendants, but I will leave us on a light note with just two. Kamala Harris, our first woman vice president, and the beloved senator from Texas, Ted Cruz. On to, that was a joke, right? Um, <laughs> on to our funding for ownership down payment and ownership vouchers. Um, I was gonna write notes on this, but I feel like I'm wing it uh, because I live in many of these versions, uh, so bear with me. Um, in quickly doing a research, I, I read that a program started oh, maybe two years ago, and one uh, last year, uh, the first year, one person uh, was successful in ap applying and qualifying and getting through with a house in Boston through the uh, Section 8 voucher program of some sort. Um, and then that followed the year, be the year after, which I think was last year. Um, don't quote me on this, you'll know this better than I do. 22 or 29 uh, families qualified and or were able to go through that process. Um, when I saw those numbers, I was shocked, um, literally. <laughs> it was unbelievable to me because there are so many houses for sale, but they are very much unaffordable within the city of Boston. Um, what do you tell a, a mother who's done everything right, college educated, has a kid, single parent, she works in a good job, let's say the medical field, makes good money, uh, but the, the way I've seen the funding laid out or the qualifications laid out, she's priced out of being able to participate in some of these uh, uh, programs. Um, I know they get to uh, lower income, but we also are forgetting the people who are upwardly mobile. Um, and I say that to say, we come here, we live here, we work here, we go to school here, and then after we can't afford to live in the city of Boston. Yes, she can go and move out of the city, um, but that then makes a commute longer for work, childcare, et cetera, et cetera. So it compounds. Um, similarly, if she were to get married, definitely priced out, um, but still not making enough to afford a home in Boston. Um, so something has to give in that regard, um, and I can tell about one first-hand instance where I've observed the city has given developers uh, property, city and state, pretty much for free. Um, the developers have developed houses, especially uh, over the last five years. Slowly, COVID came, some stopped, and I say stopped meaning I believe they were milking the system for the time frame where now the houses that were started at three, four, five hundred thousand dollars are now worth a million dollars. Like they're finishing houses and telling you it's a million dollars in Dorchester, in neighborhoods that people live, work, and play growing up, but now they can't afford and have to move up. Uh, that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you. And now we'll go to um, virtual uh, testimony, starting with Jenny. Uh, Marcy Len.
Oh. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jenny Masterman. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, so uh, again, my name is Jenny Masterman. I am here today. Um, I wanted first to support um, home ownership. I know the city, um, with the administration of Mayor Wu, is putting a lot of money toward helping homeowners, uh, toward helping low-income family to buy, to be able to afford um, becoming first-time homeowners. I myself, I became a first-time homeowner last summer due to my um, BHA Section 8 program that helped me achieve that. So I was able to use the Mass Dream Stash FSS and the OnePlus Boston that I know right now we uh, the mayor is asking for more funding for. So I would like to ask you guys to support the funding for the OnePlus Boston to help us and more family like mine to be able to um, buy um, homeowners, become homeowners. The second thing that I was planning to talk about, but I, I feel like I'm big because of what I'm hearing, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to say something is I, I do not, I personally do not agree of defunding the police. I agree on funding the police because why? When I make a 911 call, the first person to respond is the police. So I think what we should do instead of talking about defunding the police, we should find programs that the police can work with the kids to help them stay out of trouble. For instance, we can start with um, BPD officers who are parents in Boston Public School and invite them to come in the classroom or in the school playground to talk to kids, to read to them, to talk to them about safety. I think funding something like that would be great. I think funding like that um, will um, show safety, will make kids safe because they will see parents of their friends, parents they're already going over to have um, play date with. So. I, I do not support that because whatever we do, when we make that 911 call or when I make that 911 call, the police, they are the one coming. And from for someone who is a survivor of domestic violence, I do not want the police to be defunded. I do want the police to be able to use the money better to make us safe. Do not defund them, please. Finally, um, I heard that Yes, we don't have enough money um, to support um, families, low-income families, to buy housing. And then, yes, um, you may people may have asked their counselors when they were running for election to vote for this, vote for that, and they said yes. But one thing I want to make sure that I say today, Councillor Brian Wawel, when I first met him, I asked him, I have section it why I cannot use this voucher to pay for mortgage instead of just paying for rent, which is expensive. Don't you think that that would make more sense? He delivered. So I, I, I believe if you ask your um, counselors, they will deliver. Just like I'm, I'm working with other counselors, I'm asking them and I believe they will deliver and uh, they have been delivering. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Robert Wint. Robert, can you hear us? Robert, if you're saying something, you're probably, you're on mute. Hello, yes, sorry about that, guys. I was on mute. Good afternoon. Uh, Chair, uh, all counselors, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for uh, giving us this opportunity to uh, testify uh, today, I just wanted to lend voice to the need that I think uh, our community need at this time on a few things. Um, one of those uh, that's important to me due to uh, personal, um, you know, connection that I've had. Growing up in the city, um, something that I have now come to appreciate um, was having 
that, that community feeling, uh, having that that feeling of meeting and knowing and seeing other people uh, who were like my like myself. So the cultural center that I know is uh, brilliant for, but seems to be on pause is something that I'm advocating for and also asking for additional funding that we can get this going. Um, growing up, there were so many social, cultural association um, and clubs that were around um, that I used to attend events and um, functions that was Caribbean based um, that has motivated me um, that now at this point in my life, I'm actually a part of an organization, the, the Boston Caribbean American Association, um, that I work with a bunch of like-minded folks trying to um, lend a voice to those who um, you know, need that voice. So I truly uh, is hoping that you know, in this um, budget that we are trying to work on, that there will be a strong um, thought given to more funding. I, I know, you know, every year we, we do have cultural events surrounding the, the festival, um, which is very important for the community. It's an economic driver. It's a sense of feeling, a sense of belonging. But there is so much more that um, we can offer, um, we can do um, um, all year round. Um, the, the city have seen a huge growth in the Caribbean population. Um, we, we live in the city, we work in the city, we have properties in the city, we have kids growing up now. And unlike me, who had some sense of, um, you know, going to these functions and these events um, where we could interact and socialize. Uh, for example, my kids don't have those places. They don't have that center. They don't have anywhere to go. Um, they go in my basement or other family's basement and or you know, watch TV or, or YouTube uh, videos. So I think it's imperative that culture system it, that work and, and that, that may alleviate some of the other problems that the city has as well. Um, so I'm really hoping that the city councilors can really um, work with Mayor Wu to really push and us as a voice as well in the community can really um, ensure that um, we really get this going. And, uh, and part of that as well is, is um, I, I think if we start to teach Caribbean history in school as the other representative Kwame spoke to earlier, Caribbean history is such an important thing, um, especially with again, the growing demographic um, in the city. If that could be added to the curriculum um, and, 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 and children could understand um, people who played an integral part um, in us, you know, getting where we are at today and, and why it's important to carry on the work that allows me to be here today in front of you guys speaking. Um, I, I, really, I, I really think it will be uh, an added benefit um, in, the, in, the, in the near future and long-term future to have something like that um, added to the, um, the, the BPS um, educational curriculum. So those are, are, are two things that I, I think um, is, is very important to my community um, that I represent. Um, and I do hope that uh, we will see some increased um, funding uh, for these items. And not only that it's there, but it, it starts to happen. There's some effectuation thank, uh, of these things. Thank you, Robert. So thank you. Thank you. And just for the record, I just want to acknowledge that we also been joined by, joined by uh, Council Murphy and also Council Durkin. Um, want to thank everyone for testifying today. Um, want to give a big shout out to our young people. Um, and I'm happy to meet with YJPU um, to have conversations. Um, my office also has a youth council, so maybe to see if there's any collaboration to have that this conversation as a whole. Um, I'm open to having that conversation as a collective of young people 
um, across the city of Boston. Um, with that said, um, just want to just remind the public that the next public listening session is on, just pull up this date. May 22nd at 6 p.m., um, but then also at the end of every or at every departmental hearing, the public is, has the ability to testify. Um, but with that said, this hearing on dockets number zero. Oh, there's someone else on Zoom? Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, Sam Pierce, you now have the floor. Um, I just wanted to just first of all say thank you both for uh, having this budget meeting and I wanted to hopefully advocate for more vocational training. I know obviously um, we talked about some things extensively in the budget hearing but I would like to hopefully see us have more funding for vocational training specifically and also hopefully uh, allocate some funding for uh, infrastructure. Um, as far as fixing our schools, a lot of our schools, as you know, are falling apart. And so I just ask that you all think about that um, when you're deciding the budget. Oh, thank you, Sam. Let me just double check. All right. Big shout out to Central staff for all their work today. Um, again, I just want to thank all my council colleagues, my vice chair. Council Pepin, Council President Louis Jen, Council Santana, Council Flynn, Council Murphy, Council Durkin for joining us here today. Uh, we're looking forward to a robust conversation around the budget and the hearing on dockets number 0670 through 0678 is adjourned.